Greetings YouTube, it's me again for my second video, my first video finally uploaded after about 12 hours. Um, I'm the student witch, student because I am a student, I'm a graduate student, but also student in the sense that this is a new spiritual journey for me and it will be a lifelong journey, so by reminding myself that I'm always going to be a student, I will always keep trying my best to learn and revise and edit myself and my beliefs. Um, I just woke up from a nap, that's probably why I have these bags under my eyes. <laughs> and I'm developing a headache because since I'm kind of an empath, every time it's about to rain or the air pressure changes, I get these terrible sinus headaches that affect my vision, so that's why I have my aventurine, which um, helps me. So. The title of this video is probably going to be something like, and I have my notes down here, Approaches to Witchcraft, or My Approach to Witchcraft, um, which is probably going to be a series of me rambling, um, Postcolonial Theory and the History of Knowledge. Now, like I said, I'm a graduate student. I I'm actually in a PhD program at a very prestigious university in the United States. Um, I'm not going to name it <laughs> to protect my identity, but I'm in a literature department um, about to begin my second year in the fall and I study US Latino literature and culture. Um, that means I study the literature and cultural productions of Chicanos, Mexican Americans, um, Dominicanos, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, New Yorkans, all sorts of stuff. Um, and I also incorporate a lot of queer theory, feminist theory, and post-colonial theory, which is kind of what I'm going to touch on today and how I see a lot of the post-colonial scholarship that's coming out of Latino and Latin American scholars, um, how that jives really well with my own observations and what I understand about um, about witchcraft and why I'm following this path. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to start there and hopefully make this video make some sense. Because <laughs> I know not everybody is in academia, and academia is a very exclusive environment. Um, some of the information I'm going to talk about, uh, people who are not academics or who don't have fancy titles and degrees, may not have access to some of this information, which is a shame, but that's how academia works in a capitalist world. <laughs> so exclusion is where value comes from. So let me just start by saying why I feel like Latin American and U.S. Latino post-colonial and queer theory, but mostly post-colonial theory, um, and the history of knowledge has helped me to deepen my understanding of the craft. So, one thing that when you study post-colonial studies or history, um, it, it makes you face history and understand history from a critical perspective so you don't just believe the shit that they fed you in elementary school that the United States is the biggest, best, God-blessest country in the world and the Founding Fathers and hooray, Fourth of July, blah blah blah. You actually kind of look at history from a more objective perspective, a more critical perspective, um, but keeping in mind that 100% pure objectivity is impossible. Um, and it kind of makes you face the demons of the past. Um, for example, since I study U.S. Latino 
literature and culture, that means I have to be pretty well versed in Latin American and Caribbean history um, and the history of knowledge from the Caribbean and Latin America. So that means I need to understand the colonial period. Um, we all know in 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Blah blah blah. So by the 15, late 1520s and 1530s, Cortes, Hernán Cortes, in what would become Mexico, had, you know, basically established the Spanish Empire um, in the New World. So a lot of the post-colonial theory that I study looked to that colonial moment of what Europeans would call the discovery of the Americas but what people later and the indigenous people might have thought of as the invasion of the Americas. Um, they look to that moment as a critical moment in world history um, in which a lot of the systems of oppression that we are still dealing with were established, such as the racism, especially racism against um, people of African descent, thanks to the slave trade, which was also established at this time, you know, 16th, 17th centuries. Um, the evangelization of the indigenous populations by the Catholic Church and later on, you know, um, Protestants, at least in the Latin American context. Um, so that brought with it the Inquisition, uh, things like that. Um, so racism kind of forced and reinforced evangelization. Uh, sexism that came with that because you can't really separate race from gender when you're studying these kind of things. Um, homophobia, imperialism, and now what some would call neo-imperialism if you see how the United States in the past 200 years or so, especially within the past hundred years, has imposed itself on practically every Latin American country and Caribbean island and made its presence and its agenda known. Um, a prime example of that would be um, September 11th, 1973, um, there was a coup d'etat in Santiago, Chile, in which a U.S.-backed military dictatorship overthrew a democratically elected socialist president because Nixon, the Nixon administration in the United States and U.S. economic interests did not really like the idea of a socialist president of Chile, even though he was democratically elected by the majority of his people. Um, so they just said, you know, fuck that shit, we're gonna support this this other guy, this neoliberal capitalist military dictator. And he was in power for like 16 years, 16 or 17 years, and he tortured, well his administration tortured and murdered like somewhere between 20 and 30,000 of his own people. Anyway, I'm rambling. <laughs> so, history. So learning this kind of history and learning um, the implications of this history that people still deal with today. For example, um, in the 16th century, just a few decades after the Spanish Empire started establishing itself, really in, in Cuba, it used Cuba as like a, a center point in the Caribbean, and then also in what they called Nueva España, or New Spain, which would later become Mexico and Central America, and the American Southwest and California. Um, in about the mid 15th or 16th century, um, this guy, Fray Luis de las Casas, he started what they called the Great Debate. And he was, his main opponent in this debate was Juan Ginés de Sepúlveda. And these two men were leaders of the Spanish Catholic Church. 
because in at that time, you know, the Spanish crown and the, the Catholic Church were kind of one and the same. And Fray Luis de las Casas was arguing on behalf of the indigenous peoples of Latin America or of the territories, um, saying that they shouldn't be enslaved because at that time the Spanish Empire or the Spanish forces came in, they enslaved the indigenous populations first, but then the indigenous populations started dwindling because of all the diseases that were introduced. So even though De Las Casas is presented as the protector of the Indians or whatever, um, he was part of, he was probably part of, in my opinion, a greater concern for the empire saying, hey, a lot of our cheap free labor is dying. What can we do? So he said, we should not enslave the indigenous people. Instead, he kind of compared them to children um, and said, we need to evangelize them and care for them because they are under our guardianship. We are responsible for them. His opponent, Sepulveda, used Aristotle's argument of natural slavery to basically say, no, indigenous people, it's just their natural state. They were born to be our slaves. Um, interesting thing, because the population, the indigenous populations were dwindling, um, the Spanish Empire kind of took the lead after the, the Portuguese and started importing African slaves, thus really helping the establishment of the transatlantic African slave trade. And no one ever argued whether the slaves were human or whether they should be evangelized or protected um, or if it was their natural state to be slaves because at that time they were not even considered people. They were not even considered human. They did not even enter into the question or the argument of the great debate. So I'm using this long introduction to kind of establish the fact that this post-colonial theory and this history of knowledge, um, it, it allowed me, as I kept learning and I will keep learning, um, to establish, to kind of decolonize my mind and decolonize my own knowledge, my own assumptions, you know, the history I was taught in elementary school, um, and to think more critically. So, one of the books that had the greatest impact on me was a book, and it, I just have it on my Kindle, and I know the title is going to be backwards, but it's We Have Never Been Modern by Bruno Latour. Um, and this is the English translation. Bruno Latour is a French theorist um, about the history of science or science studies, which is a very interesting field. It had kind of a boom back in the 90s, but it's not really a big thing anymore. But anyway, this um, English translation is from 1993. And even though he mainly studies just Europe, he doesn't really touch on the whole colonial empire thing. It's really fascinating what he does. He he kind of demystifies science and he questions or puts into question how we historicize knowledge. So this whole idea that there was prehistory, there was Europe in the dark ages, everything was just crazy all this crazy beliefs and witchcraft and blah blah these irrational people the catholic church was just domineering the inquisition fear blah 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 and then bing the european enlightenment happened and we became rational beings you know descartes i think therefore i am blah 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 well latour's postulation is that well we were never modern <laughs> because modernity is a myth. It's a story we tell ourselves. It's Europeans historicizing their own history in order to fit some linear progressive model to show how they are evolving. And 
becoming more rational because, of course, rationality is valued over other types of thinking and being. Um, so it's I, I highly suggest this book. Um, it's on Kindle edition. You can get it easily on Amazon. You can buy used copies. It's been out for a while in academic standards. It's kind of old. <laughs> I mean, even though it's just from the 90s. It's not too dense. Um, and it just kind of... It helps put into question these categories that we tell ourselves. Like, oh, modern. Modernity. You know, modern somehow means good. Like, think of the 1950s space age commercials where it showed happy housewives in their kitchens with all these new appliances and the, the cheesy voiceover would say, Now, in the modern kitchen, every wife will be happy to have Maytag washing machines, whatever. Um, so that, that value that is... It has been instilled in that title of modern, somehow signifying progress, somehow signifying moving past superstition, or moving past a dependence on religion, or moving past, um, moving past barbarity or barbarism. It's a myth. Um, and he really breaks it down in a great way. And it's entertaining. Well, if you're a nerd like me, um, it's very entertaining. It's more approachable, perhaps, than some of the other texts that I'm going to be talking about in a minute. Um, so I highly suggest it. Um, the next book that I'm going to talk about, this one is really dense, and I don't actually recommend it. I'll just give a cool overview of it, or try to, because it is so dense. But it is, at least in my field, if you do study post-colonial things or um, Latin American, like the history of Latin American thought, this book is essential. Again, super duper dense. It was not written for a general public. It was written by an academic for an academic. This is Walter D. Mignolo's Local History, Global Designs, Coloniality, Subaltern Knowledges, and Border Thinking. So right there in the title, he's including these key words that unless you're versed, or unless you're fluent in academic ease, as I call it, it's already excluding a general audience. And that's really unfortunate that, again, how academia is kind of an exclusive club. But I'm fighting against it. Um, Mignolo, he's a professor. This is from the year 2000. And it's not perfect. I have my own critiques of the book, which I, go, I won't get into. But he's a professor at Duke currently, I think. Um, and he's kind of a big name in this field. And which is why he deserves to be respected, but not glorified. Um, his premise is that Europe, as it invaded the New World, that not the Enlightenment, which happened in the 18th century, according to European historization. Rather, modernity began with the colonial encounter and the colonial invasion of the Americas. Um, and that is when Europe took all of its paradigms, Christianity, how it understood the world, how it measured the world, how it labeled the world, and just, boop, applied it to the new world as if it was just a continuation of itself. So, he really breaks that down. And again, this is the history of knowledge. He's, he's arguing that the European local histories, again, how Europe understood, labeled, measured, calculated the world, local, was applied on a global scale. And now, the term coloniality, I want to kind of define, and I'm going to use an article um, from 2012, no, 2007, by another Latino post-colonial theorist, um, Nelson Maldonado Torres. Um, 
He has a great article on the coloniality of being, contributions to the development of concept. And he kind of builds on Mignolo because there are some shortcomings in Mignolo's book. But I just want to kind of talk about coloniality for a second. Because coloniality is different from colonialism or the colonial encounter. So coloniality is different from colonialism, he says. Colonialism denotes a political and economic relation in which the sovereignty of a nation or a people rests on the power of another nation, which makes such nation an empire. So, pause. Think of the British Empire and how India was a colony. That is colonialism, that historical moment in which India was a colony of Britain, of the British Empire. Back to, um, back to Torres. Coloniality instead refers to long-standing long patterns of power that emerged as a result of colonialism, but that define culture, labor, intersubjective relations, and knowledge production well beyond the strict limits of the colonial administrations. So, um, an example would be going back to India after independence is made in the mid-20th century. Coloniality would describe how British racial categories and systems still affected even after the ending of the British Empire or at least once India as a nation-state reached independence. Coloniality would be used to describe how British racial categories and um, hierarchies kept having a presence and a power in India even after the colonial administration of England or Britain left. That would be coloniality. Another example, um, more closer to home, you know, the tra I was speaking about the transatlantic slave trade, which was established in like the 16th and into the 17th centuries by the Spanish and the Portuguese and later, you know, Britain. Um, how the importation of slaves, African slaves, into the New World, even after um, the nation states in South America and even after the United States gained independence, um, that slave trade and those hierarchies of people based on the color of their skin or whatever kept kept going. Those hierarchies didn't exactly go away. So that would be like the coloniality of race, for example. Um, so where am I going with all this? History, coloniality. Ah! That leads me to the question of privilege. What types of knowledge are privileged? What types of knowledge were privileged by these colonial systems? So the coloniality of knowledge is what I'm talking about. In academia, I know I'm talking about academia a lot, but that's where I am and I plan on being an academic. Um, I plan on being a professor and being part of that world for the rest of my life. So in academia, scientific and mathematical paradigms have more privilege than any other forms of knowledge production. Um, so if we think of a common, a common way for someone to attack witchcraft, um, if, if they're not using the classic Christian, you're going to hell, you're worshipping Satan, blah, blah, blah. Let's say an atheist decides to attack witchcraft. They're going to call it irrational. They're going to say it doesn't have any scientific proof, blah, blah, blah. So their arguments are going to rest on the scientific paradigm, assuming that the scientific paradigm is somehow more rational or can somehow more clearly measure or describe how the universe works. Um, for example, I've even had a friend tell me that mathematics is the language of the universe. No. <laughs> mathematics, science, theoretical physics, 
whatever. They're all just different paradigms, or if we want to use this analogy, they're different languages that we can use to talk about, theorize, and write about how the universe works and witchcraft or other forms of spirituality, um, other fields in academia like literature, philosophy, the fields that get less funding in general. <laughs> um, those paradigms, fields, languages are equal or should be seen as equal and should be seen as equally capable of describing the universe, the world, and our relation to it. Um, and this privileging of the scientific and mathematical paradigms or languages dates back to the foundations of modernity which were founded according to these post-colonial theorists that I'm interested in. Um, they were founded in the colonial encounter, in the establishment of an empire in the Americas. And, you know, um, as far as the, the Iberian Peninsula is concerned. Um, so, for me, decolonizing or reworking my own knowledge and how I understand the history of knowledge production and how I understand the history of the country I live in or the history of other parts of the world. Decolonizing this knowledge is intrinsically related to witchcraft because it is a re-evaluation of those categories of knowledge, those paradigms, and a re-evaluation of witchcraft as a legitimate way to describe the universe and my place in it. And this is a super long ass video and I probably will <laughs> I don't know who's gonna watch it. It's me just rambling. Um and I know a lot of the concepts I've been talking about um are not well known outside of academia and speaking of privilege <laughs> academia is a place of privilege um it is a place of exclusion um only certain people have access to knowledge and other people can't and that's really unfortunate I just hope I tried to make this as clear as possible so that maybe those who have not been as as fortunate as I have um, to maybe go to grad school or even go to college and have access to these types of knowledge um, maybe I, I have sparked some interest I don't know um, and maybe others may have comments about this and suggestions I'm probably gonna make another video about another book um, that is you know foundational for my understanding of witchcraft and but it's not something that you're gonna find in your typical metaphysical shop and that is Borderlands La Frontera by Gloria Saldua so I'll make a video about this in a second probably um, I, yeah, I, I can't unplug myself from my work and my work um, in the sense of um, my work as an academic or as a future academic. I mean, I'm still a grad student at this point. Um, so I, I can't disconnect my spirituality from the work that I'm doing. And it, that in itself is probably a privilege because not everybody has the luxury of being paid to do something they're passionate about and I'm very fortunate in that aspect. So that's why I wanted to make this video as one of the many approaches I have to understanding witchcraft um, is intrinsically post-colonial and it intrinsically has to do with the history of knowledge or the history of knowledge production. So Thank you for watching, for anyone who's made it this far, or for anyone who's ever going to take the time to watch this, um, and blessed be. Bye.